the idea of this talk is basically to provide with questions and hypothetical scenarios that can possibly happen with current neural network trainings. So I really invite the uh, audience to actually brainstorm about those questions and, and possibly think of a uh, analytical solution towards it. So uh, with that, uh, uh, let's get started. So we'll start by watching a short video um, and we will we'll come to realize what, what this video is exactly uh, discussing about in, in the next few slides. So basically what you're seeing here are, are the loss landscapes of a ResNet 20 uh, having different activation functions. And uh, basically you're seeing the comparison between non-smooth and smooth activations like ReLU, Mesh, and Swish. So you can see like ReLU has uh, a very sharp uh, loss landscape and has a few saddle points while mesh and swish the smoother alternatives provide a much smoother landscape which is obviously very easy to optimize and thus leads to much better generalization as compared to its non-smooth counterpart so um, this video was done with javier Idemi, so big shout out to him so now with that let's get uh, into the actual stuff so what's the idea of smooth activation? So uh, we have had in current neural network scenario, ReLU being probably the most uh, standout activation function to be used in all the different computer vision tasks that we can think of. And that's probably because of two reasons. One, it works very well. It's like universally works pretty well across all the different tasks like image classification, semantic segmentation, object detection, any drop downstream computer vision task that one can think of. And also ReLU is super efficient, super lightweight and easy to implement. And it also makes the whole training process much faster. But currently uh, we have had some very interesting hype around smooth activation functions. Uh, and what's the general idea? The general idea is basically that, um, okay. I guess this might be uploading. Uh, right. So the general idea is that we have activation functions uh, which have a smooth profile. Uh, by smooth here, I mean that uh, they are C1 smooth, which means that the first order derivative is continuous. And usually we would prefer to have a non-monotonic profile as well with the capability of preserving sm small amount of negative weights because that's one of the key drawbacks of ReLU because it thresholds all the negative information to zero. So we have a significant loss of information. And that actually plays a huge role uh, when we are dealing with deep networks. So- uh, Deganta, as you I can actually uh, figured I'd ask some questions through this talk and I actually invite uh, Mitra, I guess, if you have any questions, you can also pipe up. Uh, so I think of the, the fact that ReLU sets a lot of values to zero as kind of actually a feature rather than a bug because it sort of says, oh, there's, you know, there's nothing here. Uh, there's only, I can only sort of signal the presence of something. Uh, and so there's lots of uses of like non-negative matrix factorization where positive only is a useful idea. So I, I think, could you just expand a little bit more on why people think this non-monotonicity in things like Swish and Mish is so useful? Great. So yeah, perfect. So uh, actually, uh, there has been significant discussion around why make it, you know, non-monotonous if you are actually going to preserve negative weights, then you can go with the alternative like uh, leaky relu uh, or like a shifted soft plus or, or you can go with other alternatives which, which do not uh, like collapse down to zero at minus infinity. Uh, it hasn't been very well explained in literature yet. At least I haven't found concrete reasoning behind the fact that why one would want to uh, possibly only preserve negative weights uh, in a small amount, which is closer to zero. But the general idea is that uh, the weights usually learned in, in a neural network are very much closer to zero. And kind of it's considered that weights which are farther apart are sort of outliers and not necessary. So the, to answer the question, uh, there hasn't been as a concrete reasoning on the fact uh, that why we would like a specifically non-monotony profile. But the whole idea is that we would uh, like to have a smooth continuous profile for activation functions so that uh, when the optimization happens, the 
gradients are smooth and that actually plays a huge role uh, not just in normal training but also in train uh, in training of adversarial samples which we'll get to next but that's a open ended question for for the community to uh, you know really brainstorm about to think like why we we really prioritize on positive waves and and only give a small amount of priority to negative waves in in examples like swish mesh or uh, gaussian error linear nets or any other uh, non monotonic activation that exists out there mm -hmm. yeah thanks for that's a that's a great answer i think the fact that the swish activation was discovered by the sort of architecture search really it, it really demands to be answered why that's so useful yeah absolutely uh in fact uh swish the uh, the formulation of swish was earlier proposed in uh sigmoid inverse linear unit uh it's called silo and uh and even uh glu can approximate the form of swish as well so the the uh, profile of activation function being non-monotonic and ha having that small amount of uh, negative weights being preserved is is still very much open-ended and we haven't yet figured out uh, in absolute detail about why we are doing that but we can clearly see its benefits uh, and that's kind of outshining uh, and, and speaking for itself as compared to uh, piecewise functions like ReLU which threshold the negative information to zero. So um, continuing with that, one of the examples that um, I'm gonna shortly discuss about uh, in terms of non-monotonic activation functions is, is, a, is a function that I created, it's called MISH. And uh, it's basically a very, very closely related to SWISH and in fact was heavily inspired by it. And the function is basically input into tan h of soft plus of input. And um, as you can see in, in the plot here, uh, it, it somewhat has the same amount of negative information being capped uh, in, the, uh, in the profile of the activation function. So uh, why is this important and, and why specifically are we looking at functions which, which have like this profile similar to swish and mesh? Um, so first of all, these activation functions which which share the same profile as that of mesh and swish are really uh, more robust to uh, increase in depth of the neural network and as i just stated before the start of the talk that some parts of my presentation will be highly correlated to that of my thrust. i think this is one of them that we can take some caveats off of it that we can probably experiment with my thrust idea and see if this actually holds out in, in the representation form that she discussed about. So as you can see over here, very basic experiment. We, we take a six layer neural network and basically have uh, ReLU, MISH and SWISH as its activation functions. We keep on increasing the number of layers progressively uh, and we see that the test accuracy uh, significantly drops for ReLU uh, at an alarming rate followed by SWISH followed by Mesh. So ideally, you would want that uh, neural networks, which uh, increase in depth, should uh, uh, also have the ability to preserve its generalization capacity and not drop at the rate that Relu demonstrates over here. So, so, so um, we got to a quick mm -hmm. question. Um, so, yeah. is the training accuracy for these networks uh, comparable? Because one thing with depth, especially with a not with something like ReLU, there's not that, it's not self-normalizing at all. And Switch is a little bit closer to self-normalizing uh, so that maybe it does a little bit better. Uh, but there's, I think there's a bit of a confound of like, how well are you able to train these networks that might be resolved with something like batch norm, for example. Yeah, that's a good point. So uh, I should clarify that all these experiments were done with vanilla settings, which means that all of the hyperparameters, the network uh, parameters were shared for all the three networks. So uh, we weren't providing Swish with uh, optimal settings that it actually requires to thrive. So we do have certain initializations that work better with Mesh, that works better with Swish, and that works better with ReLU. But we actually chose for this experiment the uh, vanilla setting, which is uh, the default for ReLU. Uh, and uh, in terms of training accuracy, uh, it wasn't comparable as you're stating. ReLU was still lagging quite a lot. 
uh, when we increase the uh, uh, number of layers in, in our network. Uh, but Swish and Mesh were somewhat comparable, like Mesh was usually edging Swish. But again, this is not a very comprehensive uh, example to demonstrate that differentiating factor because it's still a very basic neural network and just on MNIST. So maybe adding more complexity will reveal some more hidden uh, details about, about how big or small the gap is between uh, the smooth activations, which is mesh and swish, and the smooth activations, mesh, swish, and the non-smooth ones, which is rel. So um, again, this was not the main focus for me to experiment with, uh, but yeah, since it is correlating to what Maitha discussed about, it's definitely something that I would be interested to uh, experiment with and see what the observations reveal. Okay, so uh, so what do we get with smooth activation functions? One of the prime reasons that probably users won't shift towards using smooth activation functions is that they are computationally expensive and ReLU is just too easy to implement and comes out of the box with most of the neural network packages. So it, it becomes obvious that one would rather try to just run the vanilla script rather than trying to find optimal hyperparameters for smooth activation and then using it in the neural network. But we can clearly see that it provides significant improvement in performance uh, over uh, piecewise uh, approximations like ReLU and Leaky ReLU. And, and that's, that's also in like complex tasks like ImageNet. And we also see in this uh, experiment that smooth activations also fare very well when you use like different uh, data augmentation strategies like mix up or label smoothing or mosaic. And uh, so this basically speaks that we should rather transition towards smooth activation functions, which are comparable in terms of computational complexity to that of non smooth alternatives like ReLU or Leaky ReLU uh, because of the significant improvement in performance. But that's not the only reason that we, we should consider these uh, smooth activation functions. Uh, before I go into the reason why, here's another of the downstream computer vision tasks that most of the users and academicians use to benchmark their neural networks. So object detection on MS Coco, and you can see that uh, in this example, Mesh is clearly leading by a, quite a significant margin as compared to Ligia Uh But uh, I should reiterate that uh, all these experiments uh, we did where we benchmarked neural networks on different data sets. We didn't try to find out the optimal hyperparameters for Leaky ReLU or Mesh specifically. We ran everything with the normal benchmark uh, settings that are used uh, and reported in uh, all the default papers in computer vision. So probably we expect that if we find optimal hyperparameters, uh, like as I said earlier, uh, a particular initialization uh, method that works very well with Mesh, we would probably expect to see a much larger improvement in performance as compared to what we are observing over here. So, as I started with a simple video about lost landscapes, now let's, I think it's time to dive into why I brought that up. Um, it's really interesting to see uh, the performance improvement that smooth activation functions are providing as compared to ReLU or Leaky ReLU. But we wanted to explore what is happening actually and what's driving that performance improvement. So um, first of all, we take this example where we have a ResNet20 architecture and we employ it with ReLU and Mesh. Uh, and we just visualize its lost landscape over here. And you can see that uh, Mish has a much smoother uh, loss landscape as compared to ReLU and also has a lower minima point. So that essentially reflects to uh, better generalization. But the smoothness of the loss landscape correlates to much easier optimization, uh, thus not only resulting in performance improvement as compared to ReLU, but also converges faster uh, just because of the geometric uh, interpretation of the smoothness that we are observing by introducing uh, non-monotonic functions like mesh or swish. Uh, 
So this is this is really interesting to see because uh, sometimes uh, performance metrics uh, is probably the only standalone metric that is used to compare uh, activation function performance, and they might not reflect the actual thing happening in the background. So this really uh, consolidates that smooth activation functions are indeed helpful in not just uh, improving your neural network training process, but also uh, can allowing it to converge faster. So there's a trade-off uh, where you use ReLU, uh, which is inherently faster per epoch, but takes more epoch to train. But then there's Mesh, which is inherently slower than ReLU per epoch, but takes less epoch to converge. So it's it's sort of a perspective that you have to choose between which one uh, is the fittest for, for your own neural network setting, but usually uh, smooth activation functions stand out as compared to non-smooth ones like ReLU over here. Um, Diganta, a couple of questions. Yeah. Uh, so the first one, this is coming in through uh, uh, from a from a viewer. What was the motivation for the functional form for Mish? So it's there's like these nice motivations you've been giving in terms of of smoothness and in terms of preserving those negative values. But where did that uh, motivation come from, and what intuitions may you've gained in like finding that form uh, for Mish? So that's a good question because there's a really interesting story behind it. Um, in 2018, I, I, I was basically participating in a machine learning competition, in-house machine learning competition, and it, it was a task to simply build a classifier. And, um, and my classifier that I was training, uh, although it, it, it was really good, it, it wasn't just cutting the mark uh, as compared to other submissions that were coming in. So I basically randomly searched up uh, what I, what can I do in my in my neural network that will probably improve the performance, and one of the uh, standout points that came up were activation functions, and you can probably play around with it and change the uh, activation function from being ReLU to something more smooth like Swish. Um, so uh, I did play around with Swish then, and um, in some of my problem tasks, Swish didn't uh, perform as well as I would have wanted. So I basically tried to formulate uh, functions which basically represent the profile that Swish has, uh, but at the same time performs much better. So as you can see in this graph, the formulations that I came up with are, are shown in the graph. So I came up with mostly a combination of uh, tan, hypotenuse, and softness, uh, because I found out that their combinations really provide a lot of different varieties of activation functions which can perform really well. And um, I did a search on that space and I, I and from that search, I found out that Mish uh, was uh, robust across all the tasks that I, I trained, all the different activation functions that I found in that search. And also it was uh, consistently better than what Swish was performing. So um, yeah, that that's the, that's the starting point of where I basically found the functional form of mesh. Although there has been future work on top of it to introduce like a beta parameter into the soft plus uh, component of mesh to allow uh, it to be trainable so that the non-monotonic depth that we are seeing in the negative side can be controlled and can be trained inherently by the model. But this is the general interpretation. You can obviously introduce that beta parameter, but it will obviously come up with its cost. And uh, personally, uh, I haven't seen much difference between uh, having the beta parameter introduced into the functional form, both in Mesh and Swish. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's I, I hope that answers the question of where I got the motivation behind uh, designing the functional form of Mesh. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is there any question? Any other questions? Yeah, I actually had one question I wanted to ask about these. So, you know, the loss landscape is in the end really a very high dimensional object, right? So there's probably tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of parameters in the neural network that you're considering here. And right now we're looking at the loss landscape in two directions. So I'm curious, a, like where do those two directions come from in this particular example? And then B, what attempts have there been to look at 
summaries that can take all dimensions into account to calculate uh, the properties of the lost landscape, like, for example, its condition number or something like that. Right. Well, that's, that's actually very interesting because when I was first exploring lost landscape, I, I had the same question that it's a huge space and it's like probably impossible in terms of computational complexity that we have at hand right now to visualize that whole functional space uh, at an efficient level. So, um, so the lost landscapes that we are seeing over here right now is condensed and only uh, representative of the current minima that the weights are situated at. And basically the, uh, we track uh, the contour from the weight, uh, weights of the train neural network, but we don't interpolate the whole space because if you interpolate the whole space, then the problem is that you would lose uh, the details that we are observing over here pertaining to that local minima that we are settled in, but you'll have a general overview of the whole landscape. Uh, but if you focus only to the local minima that you're currently at, then you'll get to know actually the difference between the uh, geometric structure between the two landscapes around that uh, local minima that the network is currently uh, optimized to. So, uh, so I think this was put forth in Tom Goldstein papers uh, at NeurIPS where he basically investigated the uh, difference of adding a skip connection and not adding a skip connection, which is the motivation behind ResNet. And we saw a drastic change in, in terms of the uh, smoothness of the landscape, while the one which was not having the skip connection was pretty rough. The one which had the skip connection was extremely smooth and easy to optimize and and also generalize better. And I think that speaks for itself that uh, residual connections have been employed in mostly every given deep neural network architecture. So um, this is still very new uh, because lost landscape aren't like potentially explored to the possible limit. And probably because uh, people think that we are losing out on a lot of context by not visualizing the whole space. But again, it's understandable that we have to do dimensionality reduction to condense the space into this representation form where we are only visualizing the local minima because I, I think it, uh, because there are points which exist in the last landscape that you can probably connect with. I, I think this is relevant to generative neural networks where you have mode connectivity. So, but in this case where we are visualizing activation functions, we only wanted to see uh, the lost landscape surrounding that minima because that gives a sense of how easy or difficult the optimization process was. So, um, yeah, so that's that's probably the, the reason why we condense it to such a small area of localization rather than having a very broader bird's eye view. Okay. Um, so we, we did uh, differentiate between uh, ReLU and Mesh, which is smooth and non-smooth. Um, but what's the differentiation between two smooth activation functions themselves, like Mesh and Swish? So it's kind of tricky. But in this case, as you can see, Mesh has a much more wider and flatter minima as, as compared to Swish, which is a bit sharp. Uh, and that has been proven that wider minima actually leads to better generalization. Uh, and it uh, also speaks for the fact that in our experiments, we saw that Mesh actually was performing uh, consistently better than Swish, and that was validated in this, in this uh, visualization. So why are we discussing about uh, smooth activation functions? Uh, it's not only in the context of uh, performance in terms of accuracy or generalization of the neural network, but it actually also has a huge role in uh, adversarial training of neural networks. So what's, what's adversarial training? It's uh, basically, we have this image and we have corrupted it by some form of perturbation and then the network fails to uh, correctly predict that image which it was earlier before the perturbation. But as you can see over in this example here, the images look pretty much identical to at least the human eye and a human can visually interpret that both the images are of the same class, but a neural network fails to do so. So sort of like looks don't matter in terms of neural networks uh, as long as you do not 
uh, uh, corrupt the data and give clean data to the model, which it can clearly interpret much with a much higher accuracy than ones which are adversarially corrupted. So why are we discussing about adversarial robustness? Is because there exists this notion that generalization is inversely proportional to robustness. So usually uh, neural networks which are uh, adversarially trained with adversarial samples do have the incurring cost that they go down in the generalization capacity. So they lose a few percent of the accuracy, but improve in terms of their robustness. Uh, why is it exactly happening uh, was probably given in very extensive detail by this paper by Kanai Mellon, uh, where they basically investigated into the frequency components of the input that the neural network was trained on. So as you can see in the first figure, uh, the actual natural image is being predicted by the network, which is a ResNet 18 in this case to be a mobile, but when you reconstruct that image uh, from the low frequency components only, uh, which is visually highly correlated to the actual image, the network fails to predict the correct class and actually predicts it to be a frog in this case. Uh, but as you can see, if, if you put a human uh, in this case, uh, he or she would be able to correctly uh, classify both the original image and the low frequency reconstructed image to be the same natural class, which is mobile in this case. But uh, as you see over here, if we do a reconstruction only from the high frequency components, then the neural network is still able to maintain its uh, generalization capacity on that training sample and correctly predicts it to be uh, mobile in this case. And that's quite striking because we see that this high frequency reconstructed image clearly doesn't uh, visually correlate with the original uh, image that we had from the training data set. And why is that exactly happening uh, is provided in, as I said, in extensive details in the paper, but how is this correlated to robustness? If you see the bottom uh, charts that uh, are shown, you see on the left side, we have the kernels of a layer uh, from the convolution neural network, which is a ResNet 18 which is not adversarially trained. And on the right side, we have the same uh, layer from that same network, but it is adversarially trained. So we can see that adversarially trained neural networks uh, have higher robustness, but they lose the generalization capacity because the kernels that are learned uh, get smoother, which essentially fail to capture the high frequency components, which is essential to maintain the generalization capacity of the neural network. So this kind of gives us a good sense about why uh, there is an inverse proportionality between generalization and robustness. But uh, the caveat around that is that uh, we can actually bypass that inverse proportionality by using smooth activation functions. And uh, we can actually see in this result over here that using smooth activation functions, not only just improve the generalization capacity of the neural network, but also improve its adversarial robustness. So it's, it's a win-win situation. And this happens because uh, the activation functions do not put a constraint on the kernels to only learn, a, uh, only learn smooth features and, and thus will, be able to, will not be able to capture high frequency components, but uh, they, the conversion kernels can still get the actual feature representation, which is in the case of a normal neural network training, and are able to capture the high frequency components, which thus preserves its generalization or even improves it uh, when we use like smooth activation functions like mesh, swish, or smooth ralu or softless. Uh, in this paper by Google, uh, where they propose smooth adversarial training, they actually discussed various settings of how how you can improve not only the robustness, but also accuracy, but at least the constraint is that do not drop the accuracy as we improve the robustness. And that's basically called free lunch in adversarial robustness. So you essentially don't incur any costs of improving your model's robustness in, uh, in its accuracy metric. And they did that by basically keeping the forward pass uh, 
uh, of the network to be ReLU, but change the backward pass to be that of a smoother activation function. In their case, it was an uh, activation function that they introduced called as smooth ReLU. So definitely would recommend to check this paper out because this provides a very interesting insight uh, onto why uh, the inverse proportionality between generalization and robustness might not always be uh, true and there is definitely a work around it and, and the solution is use smoother activation functions. So based on all the things we have discussed so far, we'll probably move to another domain in which is kind of gaining a lot of popularity in these days, which is uh, continual learning. And that is motivated from this uh, scenario that uh, occurs in neural networks called as catastrophe forgetting. So basically what happens if you have uh, a neural network being trained uh, sequentially on n number of tasks, uh, the network will perform well on, on the current task that it has been trained on, but it would have forgot the, uh, uh, the data set that it was trained on in the previous task, and thus it was not able to maintain the generalization uh, on the n minus, ta n minus one task that it had uh, been through before. So uh, this is not really a uh, 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 really in, like good problem to have around because essentially we want our neural networks to be uh, able to have lifelong learning capacity in them so that we can introduce new tasks to the same network and uh, ensure that the network doesn't forget the previous tasks that it had earlier trained on. So why is this important in the co context uh, that we are discussing right now? Um, before we get to that answer, I just want to quickly go through the current scenarios that we have in continual learning. So let's say uh, we have a data set which is pertaining towards task one for the neural network, and then we have trained the uh, neural network on that task one, and it performs fairly well. And then we decide to shift to a new data set for task two, uh, we don't want our network to be too plastic, which means that the network completely forgets the task one and just generalizes well to task two. We don't want it to be too rigid as well, which means that the network uh, not only forgets task one, but in the process also is not able to generalize to task two, so it hangs in the uh, midridge and, and is not able to work well in either of the tasks. We want basically to maintain a, a good stability and plasticity of the neural network, which basically means that the network should be able to learn new tasks efficiently, but also should be able to retain memory of the previous, previous tasks that it had been trained on, and overall should be able to generalize pretty well. So based on this, what are we getting towards? So the stability plasticity dilemma is basically that we have a neural network which might be too plastic, which means that it forgets the previous task, or it might be too stable. That means uh, it, it basically uh, is not able to get a good representation for the, all the tasks that it is learning on and, and like kind of hangs in between. So what my hypothesis around, around this concept is that there exists one more parameter in that criterion which is uh, robustness. So we bas I, I basically call it a stability, plasticity, robustness dilemma. So the hypothesis is as such that if you have a neural network which is being trained in continual learning settings, and there exists a lot of them, uh, which have successfully demonstrated that they can tackle the problem of catastrophe forgetting uh, by retaining the generalization capacity of the neural network on the current and as well as the previous task which, uh, on which the network has been trained. But the question is, do these uh, training settings are also able to retain the robustness uh, of the model and not only the generalization? And if that's so, uh, does there exist uh, an inverse proportionality uh, between the generalization and robustness in continual learning settings as well as they exist in normal neural networks. So open-ended questions that I would definitely encourage the audience to consider experimenting with or brainstorming about is that if uh, this uh, dilemma exists, which is the stability, plasticity, robustness dilemma, then can uh, smooth activation functions or, or in general, uh, non-linear dynamics of neural networks, the key to solving this dilemma, because we saw 
we saw earlier that they do remove that inverse proportionality uh, by giving you uh, the capacity of not only improving the generalization, but also the robustness of the neural network in adversarial training, adversarial training settings. So yeah, that's it from my side. Uh, all the related work and code and pre-trained models can be uh, made available on this uh, repository of mine. I can obviously put forth your ideas over on the discussion forum that I have in the repository. And I look forward to taking any questions. All right. Uh, thanks, Diganta, for an interesting set of experiments, papers, and ideas. I guess the um, the question I have is, so you presented some interesting intuition for how smoothness can help with robustness and help like preserve the uh, generalization capacity even when you're doing adversarial training. Do you have any intuition for why it might be the case that it would help with this trilemma of, uh, of being able to like still uh, help with robustness even when you're in the continual learning setting? Well, before I answer that question, I would rather like to put the hypothesis in more context. So what can possibly happen when you are uh, training uh, in a continual learning setting? Uh, let's say we have only two tasks at hand and we're sequentially training a deep neural network on both of the tasks. So we can expect uh, two things that, that can happen is uh, that the natural robustness of the model is lost, but the generalization is being preserved, which is courtesy to the continual learning setting that we're using. Or uh, it might be the case that the robustness is preserved for both the tasks or even improved uh, because of the fact that we are introducing more training samples and in return, we'll introduce more adversarial samples to the model. So um, the direction, uh, about how activation functions or in, in general smooth functions can, can uh, improve the situation to avoid facing this dilemma is uh, around that uh, hypothesis of which of the results come to be true. A, that is the robustness is being lost, or B, the robustness is being preserved and, and is actually or even is improved because of the introduction of new samples. So I can't really say on which of the either two scenarios will happen. Uh, and we are currently working on that to see uh, which of them is more relevant and actually happens in most of the cases. But my general idea is that essentially we want our neural networks to be uh, able to, uh, as I said, learn in a lifelong setting and not have that inverse proportionality uh, between the uh, generalization and the robustness parameter of, of the network. So, and the only solution that exists, which which can give you uh, that free lunch in adversarial training, uh, is smooth activation functions as, as showcased in that paper. So, my hypothesis is, if if is it is the case that robustness is lost, then introducing smooth activation functions in the training process of the continual learning setting will not only help to uh, improve the generalization capability of the network, but also help to retain the natural robustness of the model. But the context of it changes if if the other side if the other side of the coin happens, which is also very interesting to know why. Uh, obviously, it, it can boil down to simple uh, reasoning that uh, a we are introducing more data points to the network, so they are getting more robust because they are seeing more data points. But I believe that there might be more uh, things happening uh, under the hood that, that probably can explain either of the two scenarios. But if I am to put my bet on it, I, I would assume that robustness is being lost um, while generalization is being preserved in continual learning settings. Interesting. Well, we are, uh, I wanted to hear everything that you had to say. So we've gone quite a bit over time. Uh, so unfortunately, we can't continue discussing this, but I want to thank you for coming on and for uh, sharing your results and your thoughts with us. Uh, and I look forward to talking about this with you more in the future. Absolutely. It, it, it was such a pleasure to be here and talk uh, about 
my research with you and especially as i said sharing a podium with my is an absolute honor for me